Hello, my name is Toby Simpson and I'm the director of the Beena Holocaust Library. Welcome to this video, which is our contribution to the national online commemoration of Yom HaShoah 2020. Thank you to the organisers for giving us this opportunity to reach out at a time when, like many other organisations, we're working from home and we're not able to interact in person. So what we want to do with this video is give you an overview not only of what you can do and what you can learn when you visit the library, but also the digital resources that we offer, which we're still offering during this phase of lockdown. So in a moment, six of my colleagues are going to go through different aspects of the library's work. But first, I want to give a very brief introduction to the library and its history. The Bina Holocaust Library is Britain's largest collection of materials relating to the Holocaust and other genocides. It also has a long and unique history that stretches back over 85 years and begins with the work of its founder, Dr. Alfred Wiener. OK, so we're going to begin with a couple of images that illustrate the early life of Alfred Wiener. Um, on the first photograph, you can see him as a young boy standing next to his father, Carl. And this photograph shows the family shop. Uh, which was a business based in a town called Benchen, uh, a small town with some 5,000 inhabitants. At that time, it was part of the German Empire. Um, today, it's part of Poland. And uh, Wiener, as this photograph suggests, was perhaps foreseen inheriting the business one day, but that was not to be. Instead, the family returned to Potsdam, which is where Alfred had been born in 1885. And uh, Alfred showed himself a gifted student, um, went on to study at the Theological Faculty of the University of Berlin, and later went to Heidelberg University, where he obtained a doctorate specialising in medieval Arabic literature. And later in life, he was affectionately known as Dr. Wiener. Um, another important aspect of Wiener's early life was his patriotism and his service in the German army during the First World War. In 1914, over 120,000 German Jewish men volunteered to serve the Kaiser, uh, and Wiener was among them. He saw active service both on the Western and the Eastern fronts, and this picture shows him with comrades on the Western front digging defences. Um, Wiener was awarded an Iron Cross in recognition of bravery in his service during the First World War. On this slide, we can see some images that illustrate Alfred Wiener's work during the 1920s, when he was very active in resisting the rise of the extreme right and the Nazi party in particular. At that time, he was working for an organisation called the Central Association for Germans of Jewish Faith, uh, which did a great deal of work on behalf of the Jewish community in Germany. And they resisted in particular the dangerous myth that was promoted by uh, extreme right-wing anti-Semitic parties, claiming falsely that J Jews were somehow responsible for Germany's defeat in the First World War. Um, you can see on the left-hand side a publication called The Anti-Nazi, which Wiener was responsible for compiling, and it gathered together a huge range of useful information and suggestions for journalists and public speakers who wanted to uh, criticise the Nazi party. The Anti-Nazi was published by the Bureau Wilhelmstrasse, and uh, that was part of the Central Association where, where uh, Wiener worked. And one of his colleagues there was Walter Gisling, who pioneered the kind of counter-propaganda you can see on the right-hand side. Um, this adopted some of the techniques used by contemporary political parties, such as um, striking images, symbols, um, bright colours, especially red, uh, and also slogans. And you can see here uh, the slogan, Die Nazis sind unser Unglück, that means the Nazis are our misfortune. And this was a, an inversion of an anti-Semitic slogan, Die Juden sind unser Unglück, the Jews are our misfortune. This third slide illustrates the uh, phase between 1933 and 1938, when Wiener and his family lived and worked in Amsterdam. Um, when the Nazis came to power, uh, Wiener and his family were forced into exile, uh, recognising that as opponents of the Nazis, they were in grave danger. Um, and on arriving in Amsterdam, Wiener was determined to establish 
essential information office that could raise awareness about the danger posed by the Nazis and also the plight of German Jews, including many colleagues uh, of Wiener who remained in Germany. Um, so on the left, you can see the building where the Jewish Central Information Office was based on the Jan van Eyckstraat in Amsterdam. And on the right, you can see Wiener with the colleagues who worked there with him. Um, one of the striking achievements of the JCIO during this period was to gather over 350 eyewitness accounts of people who uh, had witnessed the crimes of the Nazis during the Kristallnacht, the November pogrom of 1938. And those 350 reports remain part of the Wiener Library's collections to this day. In 1939, shortly before the Second World War broke out, Wiener was able to relocate the JCIO's holdings to London and re-establish it there. And during the Second World War, um, his large collection of books and documentation was extensively used by the Allied governments, both the Britain and the US in particular, um, to support the war effort. Wiener was able to provide uh, digested, concise, well-sourced information about the Nazi party and state. After the end of the war, the library became an essential resource in a number of ways. Firstly, supporting efforts to achieve justice, for example, during the Nuremberg trials and during the Eichmann trial. But also, it became an essential resource for early researchers, um, not only into the uh, origins of Nazism, but also into the facts of the Holocaust itself. And um, this was the case not only in Britain, but also internationally. There's so much more to say about the fascinating history of the Wiener Holocaust Library that I haven't had time to say today. But I hope I've given you an impression of who Alfred Wiener was and how and why he started this amazing institution some 87 years ago. Um, I'm going to hand over now to other members of the staff team who are going to take you through what we can offer both online and in person. Hi there. My name is Greg Toth, and I'm the Head of Collections at the Wiener Holocaust Library. I would like to talk to you a little bit about our reading room and also show you a couple of images as I talk. The Wiener Holocaust Library has a beautiful reading room on its first floor. You can see this is a picture of our building, the building in the middle, and the reading room is on the first floor. This reading room is open to all on weekdays, free of charge. It is not necessary to make an appointment. However, we ask all first time readers to bring one photographic ID to obtain a reader's ticket. A large collection of books is available on open access. You can see in this picture around 8,500 books we have in this room and the room next to it. Documents, photographs, periodicals and microfilms are stored in our basement archives. Readers can search items in our collections catalog. Internet access is available in our public computers and through our Wi-Fi networks. Books marked as reading room open access in the online collections catalog don't need to be requested. Documents, photographs, periodicals, and microfilms, they need to be requested using call slips available in the reading room. Call times for ordering from the basement stores are available on our website, and the maximum number of requests per call times is six. If you have any questions, please speak to our colleagues at the inquiry desk or email the collections team. All members or friends of the Wiener Library may borrow books. Please see our website for details on how to become a member or friend of the library. Members may borrow up to six books from the lending store for up to three weeks. These can then be renewed twice, either in person, by telephone or email. Making copies from our collections is possible that has to be approved by staff at the inquiry desk. Permission to copy materials depends on its physical condition, 
or copyright. And some materials may not be copied at all. You cannot visit the library. We can send you digital copies of our materials. To order copies, please contact the collections team. There is a fee for this service to cover administrative costs. I look forward to meeting you in the reading room. Hello, I'm Barbara Warnock, the Senior Curator and Head of Education at the Wiener Holocaust Library, where I curate our exhibitions and I oversee our education programme. And today I'm going to talk to you a bit about our unique and amazing collections and show you some items from our collections so that you get a kind of taste of, of what they're like. I'll also talk to you a bit about some of the uses that we make of our collections and talk to you about our exhibitions programme and also our um, tours and events and workshops. And our educational workshops very much draw upon our archival collections um, for their content. So I'll just now start to show you some of the items that we have in the collections. So our collections are really um, amazing and very diverse. We've got a large collection of um, books on relevant subjects, but also extensive collections of um, pamphlets from the 1930s and 40s and later, um, eyewitness testimonies to the Holocaust, Nazi documents, contemporary newspaper accounts and many, many other things. Some of the collections that we've got are very unique. So you can see here on this slide on the right hand side, um, a packet of tomato seeds and these date from the 1930s. But concealed within this packet of tomato seeds was actually an anti Nazi pamphlet. And this is just one item that we've got in a large collection of hidden anti Nazi writings that we have. Um, in our archive. And our archival collections are stored in safe conditions in our building in Russell Square um, in our archive stores. And you can see a photograph of um, some of the archives on the screen now. In our collections and in our archive, we've got the 1930s material collected in Amsterdam by the Jewish Central Information Office, by Alfred Wiener and his staff. So these include some um, amazing um, and rare items, such as on the left here, uh, an incredible photograph album that was taken um, for the Jewish Central Information Office in Amsterdam. And this photo album, was taken by um, somebody who traveled through Germany and every time they encountered a street sign that had anti-Semitic um, writing on it, they photographed it and they produced this for us. And it's um, a very important document of um, anti-Semitism in this form in Germany in the 1930s. Also on the screen is another document from the 1930s, which is also housed in our archive. And this is um, a ballot paper from the 1936 Reichstag elections. And you'll be able to see there um, how democracy, obviously, at this point in Germany was a complete uh, sham. In recent decades, our, con our collections have continued to expand, particularly in the area of what we call refugee family papers. So we have received hundreds of donations of collections of documents, photographs and papers from Jewish refugees or their descendants. These are Jewish refugees who came to Britain in the 1930s and 1940s. This is a really rich collection um, containing sometimes official documents, family photographs, personal items, personal documents and letters. And on the screen now you can see just some examples from this collection, including a photograph um, top left of Ludwig Neumann on his release from Dachau concentration camp in late 1938, a photograph taken by his family. Next to him, this picture of, of a plane was drawn by a young boy um, and sent to his stepbrother and this boy came to Britain on the kinder transport from Czechoslovakia. And below that, um, a touching drawing from a, a father 
stranded um, in uh, Lvov in the Soviet Union um, and a drawing that he sent in a letter to his daughter who had again come to Britain on the kind of transport. So it just gives you some sense of the um, rich diversity of our refugee family um, papers collection and, and we're very much still collecting that material. I'm just going to talk to you now about how we um, use some of these collections in our exhibitions. So we have a number of traveling exhibitions which are available to hiring which include um, exhibitions on Kristallnacht, um, on rescues of the Holocaust, um, also a recent exhibition that's come to us is about the Kitchener camp rescue and also recently we produced this exhibition about the kinder transport drawn almost entirely from our own collections and called the thousand kisses stories of the kinder transport. And we have a very rich, again, collection of documents um, about the kinder transport from British documents to family papers and institutional records and other items. Our exhibitions aren't just travelling exhibitions, though. Um, we have an exhibition space in our building at 29 Russell Square in London, and we have a programme of exhibitions that largely draw upon our collections. Um, we have about three exhibitions a year. They're always um, free to visit and they can they contain um, items from our, our collection. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our exhibitions and future plans and, and give you some examples of previous exhibitions we've done as well. So at the moment, um, I'm currently working on an exhibition about Jewish resistance to the Holocaust. This, this exhibition was due to launch in mid-May, but because of coronavirus is likely going to be later in the year, so um, we'll keep you posted about that. And this exhibition explores um, different aspects of um, Jewish resistance to the Holocaust from armed resistance, such as that of the um, of Jewish partisans, such as as, as this group pictured here um, from Lithuania. Um, the exhibition also explores more spiritual, cultural, religious aspects of resistance that occurred as well. And one amazing example that we have of this is contained within um, a very extensive collection of diaries and journals that we have of Philip Manis, who um, was in Theresienstadt ghetto, and he kept um, these journals and diaries. Other people contributed to them, and he um, was able to um, kind of keep a sense of um, culture going inside the ghetto, partly through his use of his journals and also through events that and lectures that he organised there as well. And we have those in our collection and they'll feature in this exhibition. In addition to our varied programme of exhibitions, we also have lots of different events ranging from talks by historians and others to book launches to occasionally film screenings. We have um, sometimes PhD students talking about their latest research. We sometimes stage extra tours um, and we also have programmes of events um, which are on the theme of the exhibitions that we have. So I've just shown you a sample there of some of the events we had um, one week last year. We also have a busy programme of workshops, tours, um, and talks. Um, so we, we do workshops for school students, undergraduates, postgraduates, um, teachers sometimes as well. And we also have um, a weekly tour every week on a Tuesday of the archives um, and sometimes other tours as well. So there's lots of ways that um, you can come and see and see us and visit us and see our collections and get a sense of who we are and what we do. Um, all of our um, work really draws upon um, our amazing collections, so I hope today I've managed to give you a sense of them and also of the work that we do. Hello, my name is Roxy Baker and I'm going to talk to you today about one of the library's educational projects called The Holocaust Explained. The Holocaust Explained is an educational website um, that aims to teach British school children about the Holocaust. Um, 
the website was originally created by the London Jewish Cultural Centre, or also known as the LJCC, which was formerly based in Golders Green. Um, when the LJCC was amalgamated into JW3, the library took over custodianship of the website, um, and that was in around 2016. And since then, we have undergone a project of kind of extensive uh, revitalization with the website. Um, we've had it redesigned and we've republished and reviewed most of the content on the site as well. And in doing this, we had several aims. Uh, our primary aim was to uh, showcase our own unique archival collections at the library, um, as we feel that they can really kind of benefit uh, children learning about the Holocaust and really help them visualize some of the aspects of that. Um, and we also wanted to add several new features, um, you know, several some new content in line with the British curriculum, but also brand new features such as uh, our educational resources page, um, which is primarily aimed at teachers um, and giving them the tools necessary uh, to teach the Holocaust um, in an accurate and engaging way as well. And I'll, I'll show you that page later on. But to begin with, I'll uh, I'll take you through the website. So if you bear with me, I'll just share my um, screen with you. There we go. Um, so this is the home page of the website. And as you can see along the top here, there are nine different um, sections. Uh, they start with what was the Holocaust and it goes right through to survival and legacy. And above this main bar, there's also some additional resources. So, for example, our educational resources page I just mentioned, a timeline um, and also some survivor testimonies there as well. Um, so you can either access the the content on the site directly. So if you're looking specifically at Gettys and Camps, you can click right on that section or you can click the Start Exploring page here, which will take you through to the beginning of the site. Uh, today, we're going to look at the Life in Nazi Controlled Europe section, so we're just going to jump straight in here. And as you can see on the left hand menu uh, of the screen, there are six different subsections uh, that take you through uh, different topics in this area. So from everyday life and oppression through to economic policy, foreign policy um, and the Second World War. And then there's also at the end some case studies on different countries that were occupied by Nazi Europe. By, Nazi, by the Nazis as well. Um, so if we click on, for example, everyday life, you can see here one of our documents from our archive, um, which is a drawing by a German, a young German schoolgirl uh, called Gerda Naber, and that actually shows the, the Nuremberg um, laws, the racial laws which uh, defined Jews um, in 1935. Um, but if we also scroll down, you can see a more thorough page. So that's the landing page of this section. Um, but for example, we have articles on what life was like for young people under the Nazis. Um, and there's a whole article here on that. You can see that some words are underlined, um, which means that they have additional definitions if they're complicated. So for example, the word indoctrinate uh, is, might not necessarily be something that a 13 year old understands. So it just gives a bit of a further definition of that. Um, but there are also some on, for example, the Hitler Youth um, and, you know, just different aspects that children might not know as much about or might want to know more about. Um, so they can hover over them and get extra information. And as you can see, this is the archival resources that I was talking about um, in my introduction. So you can see here that we've managed to integrate quite a large range of the diff library's different sources. Uh, so there's photographs. So these are of obviously the League of German Girls and the Hitler Youth. Um, but there are also things like this, the leaflet of the Hitler Youth um, that was published in 1937. Um, and there's also items. So this uh, jigsaw uh, can either spell out the word Hitler or it can be used uh, to create a swastika as well. Um, and that was aimed at young children in Nazi Germany. And there's also, for example, anti-Semitic books um, by Ernst Heimer and others that the library has quite a large collection of. Um, and it shows some examples from inside those as well. I just wanted to show you additionally our brand new educational resources page. Um, so currently this page is split into three different topics, um, each of which contains contextual information, uh, worksheets, activities um, and primary sources, which all of which you can download. Um, 
but we are looking to continually update this. Um, we've currently got new educational resources planned on Roma and Jewish resistance as well. Um, but for now, I'll show you the pre-Nazi era life um, worksheet, which can be really helpful for teachers um, teaching about, for example, Weimar Germany or um, or any type of pre-war life in Germany. And um, so as you can see, there are several sources here that are available for download from our archives. Um, and you can click through them, decide which ones to download and click download at the bottom here. In addition to, to this, there's also a worksheet, as I mentioned. So if you click on the hyperlink, it opens up this PDF, which is obviously available to download as well. Um, and the PDF explains uh, explains what who the educational resource is aimed at, uh, the relevant curricula, um, prior knowledge assumed, and then also then goes into being a worksheet um, that has both primary source examples, which you can download in the previous section, um, as well as activities and questions. And a list of answers uh, to these questions are at the bottom. So hopefully that's kind of given you a brief glimpse of what the site aims to do and what's on the site, as well as there's a lot more stuff that I, I couldn't show you. There's over, you know, over we've added over 500 different sources across 300 articles um, across those nine sections. So it's a huge website and there's there's lots on there. So it's got a, a huge amount of potential and it continues to be popular um, as it was when we, we took over custodianship of it with millions of views and millions of users per year um, across, you know, hundreds of countries. I think last year we we managed to reach uh, 277 countries, uh, which is obviously fantastic. And I think especially in um, trying times that we're in at the minute, uh, being confined to our, our houses, um, the website is a really great resource for those lo looking to learn about the Holocaust um, or, or not being able to learn in a more conventional manner. Um, so yeah, I hope that that was interesting um, and I hope everyone is, is safe and well. Thank you very much for listening. Um, my name is Elise Bass. I'm the senior researcher on the International Tracing Service Archive, which is a digital archive, a copy of which is held by the Wiener Holocaust Library. Um, what I'm going to do now is explain what the International Tracing Service Archive is, what it holds, how we use it in the library, and how, if you feel that the material would be useful to you and your research, how you can access it yourself. I'm also going to start referring to it as ITS, just because International Tracing Service Archive is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so, the ITS, it is one of the largest collections of material connected with the Holocaust in the world. It holds over 30 million documents connected with the experiences of over 17.5 million people who were caught up in the Holocaust. So it's a vast archive, it, it, it uh, contains a huge amount of material. I tend to think of this material um, in two categories. Firstly, um, material from the time of Nazi persecution itself. Um, so these, these Nazi documents, basically, which we've now repurposed as research tools. So within this, you'll have material from the concentration camps, you'll have prison records, deportation lists, um, you'll also have material connected to individual uh, prisoners. So, for example, the, the top card you can see now is a specific person's uh, prisoner record. So you can see how, if you're trying to research that person, how useful that document could be in letting us find out a bit more about him and what happened to him. So that's one part of the documentation from the, from the time of persecution itself. And the second batch of documentation um, is post-war material. So this may include things like emigration lists, um, survivor lists, when survivors were living in displaced persons camps, the material connected with that, that sort of thing, also contains information about post-war efforts to try and trace lost children, for example, to try and identify unknown dead, and to try and identify foundling children, find out where their families were and what had happened to them, that sort of thing. So this is a huge archive, as you, as you can as you can hopefully start to see. Um, how we use it in the library, we use it in two main ways. So firstly, it's used as a tool of academic research. 
So this is, is both for in-house work, so it supports our research that we carry out um, when producing exhibitions and online resources, things like that. Um, it's also accessed by external academics. So this is ranging from students uh, to professors. People come in and, and access the material in the archive to inform the latest research, which is obviously great, and that's something that we really want to encourage. The second function of the archive in the library, and this is what I do, is for family research. So what happens here is um, a person will contact me and ask me to carry out research about a specific person who was caught up in the Holocaust. What I then do is search for all traces of that person in the ITS archive. I pull copies of the relevant documents and then I try and decode them. So I highlight the most important bits. I translate the most pertinent sections where necessary, um, just to try and make them a bit more uh, understandable really, because a lot of it is quite coded information. And what I do then is I, I combine this research into a report, which I send out to the inquirer. Um, I normally try and do a little bit of extra contextual research as well, so that I'm explaining what the documents show in the context, the historical context as well. Um, it's worth mentioning at this point that even though the ITS archive is vast, there are inevitably some gaps in the archive. There will be some people who, for one reason or another, just don't feature in any of the documentation that ITS holds. Now, I can, Im I can imagine how frustrating that must be. So I always try and think of alternative archives or alternative resources where people might have more luck. So I, I try not, not to be a dead end. I try and help people figure out where else there might be material about the person that they're looking for. So if you think that you would, you know, that this could be useful for you, that you want me to see if I can find out any information about a relative of yours or a friend or someone that you know of who was caught up in the Holocaust, um, this is how you access, um, this is how you submit a research request. So to request research to be carried out, go to our website, uh, which is venalibrary.co.uk, um, and you can see on the screen now, if you click on the collections tab, that will bring up uh, a section that says International Tracing Service, you click there, that will take you to the part of our website that's all about the International Tracing Service Archive, and there you can submit a research request. Clicking that link will take you to um, a database where you put in the information that you know about the person you want to be researched. I will then receive that, and I can then begin the, begin the work. Um, worth mentioning at the moment about our turnaround time. We're a very small team, and there is a high demand for this for this work to be done, as you can imagine. So you're looking at a turnaround time of several months, really. Um, that's just something that's worth bearing in mind when, when you submit your research request. Um, one thing that is also worth mentioning uh, there's, is that a, a part of the ITS archive has already been digitized and uploaded for anyone to access. So if you're interested in carrying out your own research, you can go to this website here, arlson archiveorg and through there you can search through millions of documents yourself from wherever you are. So it's, it's, that's a really, really great resource. You can search for an individual, you can search for a theme, for a geographical area. It's a really cracking resource. Hi, um, I'm Leah Sybotham and I'm the Digital Asset Manager at the Wiener Holocaust Library and I'm going to quickly spend the next few minutes showing you other digital resources which have been produced by the library um, other than the Holocaust Explained which are available online. These include the Refugee Family Map Project, uh, Pogrom November 1938, Testimonies from Kristallnacht and a new resource which I'm currently working on and which will be launched later this year, Testifying to the Truth. Um, the first resource is our family map project, so I'll show you the home page now. Uh, this map gives the opportunity to browse and search the Vegan Library's collection of um, refugee family papers. So several hundred of these collections have been donated to the library over the years, um, and indeed we continue to do so. They have been donated primarily by Jewish uh, refugees and their families who escaped Nazi anti-Semitic persecution by emigrating either from Germany itself or from Nazi-dominated countries, including Poland, Austria and France. And indeed, if you look at this page, you can see the distribution of those collections. So we have some in Lithuania, we've got some in Ukraine, some in Hungary, etc. 
Um, for the purposes of this, though, we're going to focus in on Berlin, which, as you can probably imagine, is where a high proportion of our family collections come from. And we're going to look at this one, which is our Peter Johnson collection. Um, so Peter Johnson was born Wolfgang Josephs, and he was a Jew from Berlin who came to Britain in early to mid 1933. And he was unfortunately one of those transported on the infamous Denera to Hay internment camp in Australia. He returned to Great Britain in 1941 in order to enlist in the Pioneer Corps, um, which is when he changed his name to Peter Johnson. He became a interpreter for the British occupying forces in uh, Germany from May 1945. Um, so he was involved in the denazification process. If we look at the record himself, itself, um, there is a brief biography here on the right hand side. On the left is some sources from his collection. So there's a photograph here. There's a short testimony at the bottom, an audiovisual testimony. Um, there is a work reference for his father, Alfred Joseph, a letter from his father who was in Amsterdam in 1941, a travel permit for Peter Johnson. And then if you scroll down on the right hand side, there is a link to see in our online catalogue, which is where you can find out more information. Um, it is worth bearing in mind that not all of our family papers are included on this map and that not every document belonging to each collection is featured here. Um, it's really just a highlight and a kind of snapshot of the type of material that we do hold. Um, but, but that being said, we are currently working on adding additional content on upgrading the site to show more documents, photographs and stories from each family featured. Um, the second site I wanted to show you is called Pogrom November 1938. Uh, testimonies from Kristallnacht. So this is the home page. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, the November pogrom was an event which happened across Germany and Austria in which thousands of Jews were terrorised, persecuted and victimised. Um, it also kind of involved the desecration of over 1,200 synagogues and the looting of thousands of um, Jewish businesses and homes. Um, the kind of context of this collection is that it came about in the months following the pogrom. Um, our founder, Dr. Alfred Wiener, and his colleagues at the JCIO in Amsterdam, which is um, the predecessor of the Wiener Library, collected over 350 contemporary testimonies and reports. Um, they're really quite unique because they were compiled so shortly after the event. And this website is the first time that they are available online, that they are fairly fully searchable and that they have full English translations. So if we just look at the site briefly, um, you can learn more under historical context about the event kind of in general. You can learn more about the project itself, how things were gathered, how we preserved them in the years since. But under this tab is where testimonies and reports is where you can view the testimonies themselves. So they are all arranged here. Um, you can filter according to subjects. So they're on quite diverse topics. The ones that concern synagogues, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, the kinder transport. And then if we scroll down, if you're looking for a specific um, individual to see whether they gave a report, you can look here. It is worth bearing in mind that the majority of them are anonymous, which I guess is um, kind of understandable given that they were um, kind of recorded by the library very shortly after the event itself. Um, but if you scroll down, some have been recorded uh, kind of by the names themselves. If we just choose a testimony to have a look at now, so we'll have a look at this one, which concerns the pogrom in Dusseldorf. Um, you can view first the English translation, which is here. Um, if you click on this tab, you can see the German transcription. And then lastly, if you click on original scan, you can see the document as it appears in our collection. Um, and then using the slider, you can zoom in and out. You can use these tabs here to look at the next page. Um, so it's really quite user friendly. Um, and then finally, the last site that I wanted to show you is called Testifying to the Truth. Um, it hasn't been launched yet, but as I'm working on it currently, um, I thought it might be nice to give you a, a sneak peek. Um, you can see it looks very similar to the Pogrom site. Um, and in a sense, they are kind of sister sites, so that does make sense. And it's been created in order to highlight the unique collection of testimonies that were gathered by Wiener Library staff in the um, 1950s. So this project was the initiative of Dr. Eva Reichman, who was head of research at the library at that time. And the intention was to acquire as many reports as possible from those who had lived through the period. So advertisements were placed in the press. Um, 
and kind of culminated in 1300 submissions. Um, and this is particularly kind of important because it was at a time when relatively few people were actively gathering evidence of the Holocaust from the perspective of survivors themselves. Um, as you can see, it is arranged very similarly to the pogrom site, so you can also browse by subject. Um, because these testimonies cover the whole course of the war, it's much more diverse in its topics. It covers a lot, uh, kind of, a lot many, a lot more topics and a lot more kind of geographical reach. You can also see whether they are available in English. So the majority of them are available in English, thanks to the work of our volunteer translator team, um, who are currently still in the midst of translating. And again, you can view by witness. Um, as I said, this site, which we will hope um, which I'm working on at the moment, will be launched later this year. Hi, my name is Christine Schmidt and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library. And I'm very pleased to be able to speak with you today during the National Commemoration of Yom HaShoah, along with my colleagues from the library about the work we do and the opportunities for research on the Holocaust that we offer at the library. I'm just going to share with you a um, short presentation. Um, so as we know, primary sources, documents, diaries, uh, photographs, eyewitness testimonies, these are all the basis of historical research. And since we are one of the largest collections of Holocaust related archival and published material in the UK, we offer researchers many opportunities to engage with and use our collections for their own work. Our materials are open for research to scholars, students, family researchers, and basically anyone who is interested in learning more about the Holocaust or doing uh, more extensive research on the Holocaust. There is a tremendous amount of new and significant research being done on the Holocaust and other genocides. And so we aim to ensure that all of our activities, such as exhibitions and events, are research-led. And we strive to make sure that the latest academic scholarship informs our work. Our event series, uh, such as lectures, workshops, and seminars, bring researchers together to share new findings and to gain new insights. We also aim to be a place where uh, postgraduate students and new researchers can develop their work. So for example, we regularly host our PhD in a Cup of Tea series for doctoral and early career researchers who can present their findings and receive feedback in an open and uh, supportive environment outside the academy. And we've also hosted uh, archival discovery days, uh, teaming up with higher education institutions in order to connect researchers with each other. Our workshops have uh, focused on particular collections and allowed researchers guided access to those collections, uh, for example, on the vast International Tracing Service Archive. And we've offered these both for postgraduate students and uh, family researchers. The library uh, facilitates research internationally as well, and is one of the founding members of the European Holocaust Research Infrastructure, um, or as it's known as ERI for short. ERI aims to provide a gateway to Holocaust related documents and other archival material around the world, and also to connect people researching Holocaust. We've hosted a number of ERI fellows over the last several years, and we're looking forward to doing that again in the near future. Our staff also present their own original research at national and international conferences on the Holocaust. And uh, the library is one of the organizers of the Beyond Camps and Forced Labor Conference, which is going to be held in London in January, 2021. Um, finally, because we have recognized that there is still a gap between a wider knowledge of the Holocaust and latest scholarship, we have created a new partnership that will ensure that our collections and research reach wider audiences. Later this year, we'll be teaming up with the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway, University of London, the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association, which is a charity based in Leeds, and the University of Huddersfield to launch a new initiative called the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership. Our first joint event actually took place in January for Holocaust Memorial Day in Huddersfield, and we have planned a series of joint exhibitions, uh, fellowships, workshops, research briefings uh, for educators, as well as publications. And we see all of these activities as helping to ensure that the public dialogue about the Holocaust is rooted in the latest research and historical evidence. So this is just a short overview of the kinds of research activities we support. 
um, for our latest opportunities, it's always uh, best to check our website and to reach out to me uh, directly if you wish. Um, I'm, always, I'm always very happy to help. Um, we are going to be uh, looking into developing more of our content and more of our offering uh, for this hopefully temporary period when we're all um, shut in on, uh, and on lockdown. And um, please stay tuned to our website for more uh, information about what we have to offer. Thank you for listening.